Before we can completely understand what happened to the industry in the 1990s, we have to talk a little bit more about distribution. And it's entirely possible you never thought about this in your life, even if you read comic books, until you, know, until you took this class or started watching, watching these lecture videos. But uh, hopefully by now you've learned that just being a publisher isn't enough. You have to have a printer. And having a publisher and a printer is also not enough because you need a distributor. You need a way to get the printed product out to, uh, out to the places that are going to sell it. Remember how much trouble Martin Goodman got into in the 1950s because of his, uh, of his issues with distributors. All right, well, in the, uh, in the old days, by which I mean from like 1940 all the way up to the early 1980s, almost all comic books were sold either at newsstands or on spinner racks that were located in grocery stores, uh, convenience stores, and drug stores, and so forth. Now, the... Uh, the the way that worked was that you had to had to have a you had to have a sell through you had to think about the sell through so publishers would uh, would print a whole bunch of magazines same thing with books and send them out to bookstores newsstands and so forth and they had so long to sell them if they didn't sell them by that certain time they're taking up space then the uh, store owners would be required to rip off the cover of the comic book or the magazine or the book, the paperback book, rip off the cover, uh, destroy the comic book or magazine itself, and send a big stack of those ripped off covers back to the publisher, who will then have to give the store owner their money back because the, the book never sold. Now, the ripping of the cover is so that uh, you can prove, uh, A, that you can prove you didn't sell it, and B, to prevent you from claiming you didn't sell it and then turning around and selling it anyway because you've ripped the cover off. Okay, So that's mostly how, how comic books were bought for decades with the sole exception of subscriptions, mail subscriptions, which you could get uh, all the way back I know in the 50s, probably in the 40s as well. And for the longest time, if you had a subscription to a comic book, it came like this in a plain brown wrapper folded over, which created a crease that was pretty much permanent. In the 1970s, if you're looking through old comic books, you will find that Marvel and DC in their subscription ads brag about how these magazines are going to be mailed flat. That means they're not going to be folded over and be damaged, although the mailman usually folded them over anyway to fit them in your mailbox. Okay, then early 1980s, well, starting in the late 70s, but really pushing in the early 80s, the, the means to deliver this product to the fans started to change, and it started to shift to specialty shops, comic book shops, comic book stores. And the difference, of course, is that with the comic shops, the publishers didn't have to give their money back. So you take this deal, you accept the books as the store owner with the understanding that if you don't sell all of them, then you're stuck with them, which is okay because you are in the professional business of selling old comic books because you, know, you can just turn around and do that. Okay. You may be asking yourself, why are we going over all this again? We've already talked about this. That's true. But we haven't talked about this next part, and it is going to become relevant. All right, well, beginning in the late 1970s, Marvel started having two different kinds of little price boxes up in the upper left-hand corner. You had the one on the top, that was the way it had been done all through the 1970s with the, uh, the figure of the star of the comic there uh, in the upper left-hand corner and the copyright date. And then um, you had the, uh, the price and you had 
the uh, issue number and you had the uh, the date and you had the the serial number and all that stuff is right there in that box but again if you're looking through old comic books if you're physically picking up back issues you'll notice that sometimes instead of that box there's a much simpler diamond right there now the purpose for that was uh, to differentiate between whether this comic book was sold through uh, um, the direct market directly to uh, comic shops or if it was sold to you know um, newsstands and grocery stores and so forth because if it were the latter if it didn't sell they could rip the cover off this is this is the purpose for the the diamond here if the comic book has this diamond that means you didn't it didn't come from a grocery store it came uh, from direct sales therefore you can't get money back uh, you can't get money back for sending ripped off covers with this diamond on them back to Marvel um, by late 1980 Marvel started adding another feature the barcode in the lower left hand corner uh, which is you know a barcode for scanning uh, cash registers uh, Marvel started covering that up instead of having the barcode they started having this little picture of Spider-Man. And that was just to augment the diamond. If it's got the little picture of Spider-Man, it's a direct sales only thing. You either got it through the mail or you got it at a comic shop. So you couldn't get your money back for sending it in. Well, uh, DC started using the uh, covering the uh, barcodes around the same time Marvel did, late 1980, except they had little ads on theirs. And they didn't change their, their little price um, image uh, up top. All right. Well, that is going to be kind of relevant in a moment. Because when it comes to distribution, before direct sales, um, when you, the only way to get direct sales was by a subscription through the mail, um, the distributors of these comic books were large magazine distributors who deliver the comic books to the newsstand to the grocery store to the drugstore at the same time they delivered the other magazines that store was getting you know they'd come in on a truck they'd toss them out in a bundle okay uh, well that was to the distribution center and then from there you know they would uh, uh, take them out and they the people would come in and stock the spinner rack or whatever but once all these sales started occurring through the comics shops, the question became, how are the comics shops going to actually get the comic books? Because large magazine distributors aren't going to be making stops there just for comic books. So kind of a side industry started to grow up in the early 1980s. There were about a dozen small businesses uh, some of which had started as small publishers, some of which had started as small comic shops themselves, who got in the business of delivering, receiving the, uh, uh, the in mass the comic books and then delivering them to the various stores. Um, this was, uh, this was in the, the early 80s, like I said, and, and over time, over time, some of these smaller ones, some of the smaller distributors, which were usually regional, started to get bought up by some of the larger ones. And here we have the three, the three biggest distributors by 1990. Okay, The top two, Diamond and Capital, were really big. Heroes World not nearly as big it was a distant number three now diamond diamond distributors got their name named themselves after the little diamond in the upper left hand corner of the marvel books that showed they were direct sales now the diamond wasn't put there because of of diamond distributors it was the other way around so you had diamond and you had capital city 
um, Capital City had started as an underground comics uh, shop and publisher in the early 70s. The I think the Diamond, people that owned Diamond, had started uh, as comic shop owners. And then the third one was Heroes World that started in the mid-70s in New Jersey as a toy store, basically, that specialized in licensed superhero merchandise. Initially Marvel, but then DC as well. So a lot of those ads in the old comic books, you know, where you could get uh, Spider-Man web shooters and you could get that uh, cardboard replica of New York City with all the superheroes. That was Heroes World. And in the early 80s, they started to branch out into distribution to comic shops. Now, I mentioned that uh, Diamond had named themselves Diamond after the Marvel Diamond, uh, which is kind of kind of funny because right around the time that they were formed, Marvel stopped using that Diamond and went to using this M. I'm not sure if they stopped using the Diamond because of Diamond. Anyway, point is, point is, um, you've got these distributors. They are probably between the three of them covering about 90% of the business by the early 90s. Uh, the smaller ones had mostly been gobbled up by either Diamond or Capital. Okay, so that's where we are in the early 90s when there's been about 10 years for these distributors to kind of get the, get their feet on the ground since uh, the move toward comic shops had started. And now there's this huge national just deluge of interest in comic books. And you, like I said, probably don't stop and think about distributors, but uh, they're going to be very, very important. So let's take a look at the situation in 1993, okay? Well, for one thing, there were, since 1990, between 90 and 93, there had been 24 new comics publishers start operating. Okay, so that's a, that's a, lot, of, uh, that's a lot of companies, that's a lot of product, that's a lot of choice for the consumer, for the fan. Now, Marvel was still selling a lot of books, and they were still selling, well, uh, they were still number one. But they had gone from over 50% of the market, at one point almost 60%, to just somewhere like 35% now. And it's not because they were selling fewer comics. If anything, they may have been selling more. But there were so many other companies putting product out there, and so many fans and investors and or investors that were buying up anything that looked like it might potentially be a collector's item and a good investment. Okay, Now, Marvel itself was putting out a lot of content. In 1985, Marvel had had 40 titles. Now, remember all back through the, most of the 1960s, they were only allowed to have uh, eight books per month. Uh, and so that was 16 titles published bi-monthly. Now, 1985, they've got 40. By 1993, they had 140 titles, which is part of, part of the reason behind First Comics trying unsuccessfully to sue Marvel for uh, uh, basically creating a monopoly by flooding the market with product and squeezing out the smaller companies. Right? There's... It, there can be more and more and more new titles, but there are only so many spots on the shelves of these comic book stores to display stuff. If they've got more titles that they have slots to display them, that means they're going to be putting some of those titles down in the bottom shelf where you can't see them and they're not going to sell. Well, um, on top of that, take into account the fact that 10 years earlier there had been maybe a dozen um, mid-sized to small distributors and now there's really only three um, and two of those are big and one of them I guess you could say is mid-sized so that's fewer fewer options meanwhile 
Meanwhile, you've got, um, like, like we said, all these people buying millions of copies of these comic books that they think are going to be valuable just because Marvel and DC and Image and others are telling them they will. Um, not realizing, not understanding that the more copies are published, the less potential there is for any value at all, right? Eventually, uh, eventually everybody that wants one of these is going to have probably two of these. So that was a problem. And uh, another problem was that longtime fans were getting fed up. They were getting frustrated disillusioned and disgusted with uh, the the way that the storytelling had uh, deteriorated had devolved as it were plus the uh, this whole illusion of change thing in order for that to work you have to be kind of slow and methodical about it um, you can't just keep changing everything for the sake of changing it with everyone knowing it's going to change back and none of it means anything. So, what's going to happen? What's going to happen if the older fans, who many of whom have been loyally buying these titles for years, just get so frustrated and disappointed they start spending less money on comic books. Maybe they even quit entirely. So what's going to happen if that takes place? And then all these speculators who really don't understand how, you know, what print runs are um, and think that comic books are a guaranteed investment that are only going to increase in value. What's going to happen when all these people that have all these millions of books start trying to resell them and nobody wants them? and therefore they are valueless. Well, all those things put together, um, other than the part of what if things go wrong, but all that upswing, all that growth, that's what we call a bubble. And you know how bubbles work. Uh, they work the same in finances. Bubbles just get bigger and bigger and bigger. But it's foolish to think that a bubble will keep getting bigger forever. It will get as big as it is able to get, and then it will burst. Hmm, that almost sounds like a prediction of some sort. Well, 1993 was the high point, the high point of this uh, expanding bubble. There were 10,000 comic shops around the country in 1993. In 1994, things started to go downhill. Things started to go downhill because the very things that I just mentioned are the things that started happening. Longtime fans lost interest. And new investors suddenly started realizing these things don't really have that much resale value since so many of them were being printed and nobody wants them. Therefore, they felt like they had been misled, and in a way they had, by the publishers and also by some uh, comic shop owners who were really pushing this idea on gullible customers. And so many of those folks started to get disillusioned and bitter and feeling like they'd been taken advantage of, and they stopped buying these things. As, uh, as one fan put it in describing what happened, people who didn't like comics started buying comics, and then people who liked comics quit liking comics, and then everything broke. That sums it up really well, except for the fact it doesn't take into account what happened with distribution. You see, as the downturn started, and it started to become evident this bubble was bursting in 1994. In that year, by the way, Marvel lost $48.5 million. So, to try to salvage as much as they could, any way they could, Marvel bought Heroes World, that 
uh, distributor, the number three distributor. Marvel bought it to distribute their own books themselves through Heroes World that they now owned. That means that uh, Diamond and Capital, Capital City, are each going to lose one-third of their business, one-third of their revenue, because Marvel had one-third of the market, and they're not going to be able to carry Marvel's books now. What it means for comic shop owners is when they're filling out their orders, they're going to have to fill out two sets of orders, one just for Marvel and one for everybody else. It also means that... <clears throat> Both the, uh, well, the, the, the comic shop owners are not getting as big a percentage. They're not getting as big a deal from Marvel's Hero World distributors as, as they did from Diamond, which is what Marvel had been using, or from Capital City. So, you know, they're, they're making less money on Marvel books. It's more of a hassle to get the Marvel books. Uh, Marvel, all of a sudden, with this new company that has this they weren't a huge company to start with, right? And they've now they've got this huge commitment and they didn't have the infrastructure to do it. And so things are arriving very late. Fans don't like that. Customers don't like that. They'll just buy something else or go somewhere else. So more and more comic shop owners just didn't order as much Marvel stuff. Some of them didn't order any Marvel stuff, but that's going to lose some money because, you know, the fans want the Marvel stuff. And, you know, Diamond and Capital, they're losing money. This was the worst possible time for this to happen because it was right on the edge of the bubble as it was starting to pop, and this just pushed everything right on over <clears throat> and caused a complete collapse of the comic book industry, 1994 and 95. So in 93, there had been 10,000 comic shops Within a couple of years, 80 to 90% of them were closed down and out of business. The, uh, the various companies, Marvel, DC, Image, and etc., their profits across the board fell by 70% in one year, um, 94 to 95. So the bottom, the bottom is falling out. And Marvel is not able to, uh, not able to stay afloat. This is when Marvel started selling off the movie rights to their characters. This is why, you know, if you watch superhero movies, this is why there for a long time you had Marvel Studios that started making their own movies in 2008, doing the Avengers, but Fox had the rights to the X-Men and the Fantastic Four, and initially Daredevil and the Punisher, and Sony had the rights to Spider-Man, and it's all jumbled up. Unlike DC superheroes and superhero movies, DC is owned by Warner Communications, and Warner Communications owns Warner Brothers, so they just owned everything. They could do whatever they wanted to. It all started here in the late 90s, when Marvel is selling off everything that's not nailed down, trying to keep their heads above water, unsuccessfully. Because in 1996, they had to declare bankruptcy. So this is a pretty low point. What's going to happen next? Well, I'll tell you what the immediate consequence was. When Marvel declared bankruptcy... Heroes World was out of business. That left Diamond and Capital. And Diamond, in 1986, bought Capital, leaving Diamond practically, for all intents and purposes, in possession of a monopoly. Uh, it left Diamond as essentially the only comics distributor. And that would hold true for, well, a quarter of a century since then, and counting. Now, what else is going to happen? Marvel is going to try to make money as quickly as they can. And one way to do that is to have another big crossover. Uh, another X crossover called Onslaught. And this involved not just the X-Men, 
<clears throat> but the Avengers as well. So essentially, this super powerful super villain who winds up actually being like a, a part of like Professor X's id or something, uh, once again trying to destroy the universe and the X-Men and the Fantastic Four and the Avengers all team up together to try to stop him and successfully stop him. But the Avengers and Fantastic Four are destroyed. They're killed. Or at least that's what it looks like. In reality, according to the story, the, uh, the super powerful, uh, mentally uh, powered offspring of Reed Richards and Sue Richards of the Fantastic Four, little Franklin Richards, who is like the world's most powerful psychic, actually creates a pocket dimension that uh, sends, he shuffles the uh, Avengers and Fantastic Four off to so that they will exist there rather than being completely destroyed. And uh, that is a very convoluted way to set up what Marvel was really doing, which was to reboot the Avengers and the Fantastic Four and Captain America and Iron Man for that matter and bring back Jim Lee and uh, Rob Liefeld, who had left to form Image and who were still extremely popular. So, in essence, this little pocket dimension where the Fantastic Four and the Avengers go, dead so far as anyone else in the Marvel Universe knows, is the, the, um, the playground of Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld, they can redo the characters, re-envision them any way they want to, because, you know, uh, continuity doesn't matter. This is an alternate reality. And they do. Um, they completely start over, basically from scratch, make all kinds of changes, not just cosmetic changes to, to costumes and stuff, but some fundamental changes about, you know, the personalities, for example, of a lot of the characters. Now, some fans didn't really like that but apparently some did because this sold pretty well and what they did when um, Liefeld and Lee took over or more accurately their individual studios took over is that all these books were renumbered canceled and re restarted starting with number one so I don't even remember what Captain America was up to, like issue 430 or something. Uh, following month, under the Heroes Reborn uh, thing, which is what this whole thing was called, it's Captain America issue number one. It's a collector's item. You better buy it. And so they started over the numbering of Captain America, Iron Man, Fantastic Four, and Avengers. And when I said it was the studios of these guys... Um, Liefeld was doing the pencils for his two books. Lee was doing some of the pencils, but he was using uh, the artists who worked at his studio to do uh, a lot of it. And it's very similar to the old studios from the 1940s, like the uh, Eisner, Iger, or Simon and Kirby studios, right? There's people working for them, and they, they all work together to come up with a product uh, to deliver it to the company that's asking for it in this case. Marvel. Well, this did sell. It did sell, even if it left uh, more long-term fans feeling even more disillusioned. But um, it was only a temporary deal. Um, Lee, in particular, had not signed on to do this long-term. Marvel wanted to make it permanent. Uh, but their condition was that Lee would have to actually pencil the books himself. Uh, and he had lots of other stuff he had going. And so he said no. And all this ended. Uh, it ended, and by the time it had been going on for several months, several issues, it wasn't selling as well, and people were kind of frustrated with it. So um, there was another miniseries, Heroes Return, in which they're rescued from that alternate reality and brought back into the regular continuity of the Marvel Universe, and back, you know, to the, uh, the the personalities and the backstories that they had previously had. So this was a little bit of a, 
of a bump financially. Um, not really, I don't think, uh, much of a bump creatively. In fact, it was uh, one more bad thing about the decade, I think. But uh, another thing that it established was that from that point forward, Marvel and DC... Now, DC had kind of done this a little bit, but um, they're really going to do it a lot now. Is that whenever sales are lagging, they're going to just start over again on the numbering of the issues. You know, like uh, some of these books, like Detective Comics, had been around for, you know, 60 years, 65 years. Uh, and it was up to like, you know, issue 700 or whatever. Let's just call it number one, issue number one, because then more people will run out and buy it. And that started happening more and more. It's very confusing. If you're trying to find old comic books, if you're trying to like go through the, uh, the complete backlist and you want to say, be aware of <clears throat> all the Captain America stories, you're going to be looking at the, uh, well, you probably look at the uh, original series from 1940 that ran through the 1940s. Then you're going to look at Tales of Suspense from the 60s. And then you're going to look at Captain America 1968. And what you're going to find is that for 30 years, it's going to follow those numbering, numberings. But then from 1996 on, there's been 10 different books called Captain America and 10 different number one issues of Captain America. And it's all financial, uh, really. So uh, one more one more mark against the 90s. However, everything about this time period wasn't, uh, wasn't negative. There were some bright spots, but I'm going to save them for the next lecture.